Okay, well, welcome back, and I hope everybody's doing well. Um, this, uh, in this video, we're going to be talking about uh, measures or attributes of similarity, dissimilarity. We're, we're basically going to be looking at correlation coefficients. Um, and in this, this diagram, these diagrams that we have up here, you can see some uh, um, figures from Bohorich and Farmer's patent on the uh, coherency cube. And what you see over here, are, we have a, a basically a CMP map, common midpoint uh, map, and you can see the traces uh, inline and cross line. Over here we're looking at the basically the cross correlation, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in a second, and you can see where there is a mismatch between adjacent uh, cells. Uh, we have a high discontinuity that shows up as a large number. This would be a low correlation. And over here, when we plot all those numbers up, you can see that we've outlined the uh, uh, what looks like a, a nice channel complex here. So, just a correction, this is from their SEG Expanded Abstract back in 1995. But if we take a look at the um, look at the patent, uh, here we see, and just kind of focus on this part of the abstract here, there are details here if you want to search it out. Um, but notice that uh, what they are referring to, they basically define the process, and they say that uh, you, you've got this uh, volume of seismic data and you know spatially sampled and temporally sampled and from this volume you want to take at least or you want to have at least three seismic traces located therein measuring the cross correlation between one pair of traces lying in a vertical plane as we see here so we're looking at CMP points down here but we'd have traces running up and down uh, recording the time uh, to obtain an inline value and then we take the cross correlation between traces along the uh, cross line <clears throat> to obtain a uh, cross line value and then we combine those two measures the uh, inline and the cross line uh, to get one coherency value and then this is all displayed in the uh, 3D seismic uh, volume. We've just replaced amplitudes with uh, cross correlations. And so this is a basic idea. It's a fairly uh, simple idea. Uh, it's uh, a patentable idea. And um, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty neat. It's <clears throat> everybody, you know, everybody's known the uh, cross correlation, uh, correlation coefficient for, for uh, many, many years. So it's the correlation is not uh, Cross-correlation is not what is unique, but just the application to seismic. Now, here in a paper by Kington, 2015, you can see some comparisons. We've got the original seismic data here, and you can, you can see a lot in the seismic data. So this is a pretty nice volume to begin with. Um, you can't pull stuff like this out of the thin air. You know, you've got, uh, you've, you've got something going on in there. You can see that you have channels. And what you'd like to do would be able to uh, enhance the appearance of these channel, channels in your seismic data. So the, so the volume that was compiled by Bohorich and Farmer, the cross-correlation, this is just a plot of the cross-correlations as de defined previously, you can see a lot going on there. We've got um, some obvious channeling. We can see some channels coming out of the top on both sides. We can see some... Uh, tributaries branching off. This looks like a distributary channel complex, and then we've got uh, a channel here, a channel here, a channel there. Uh, we've got something going on in here. Now this this could be an interdistributary bay, uh, crevasse, uh, splay, bay fill, marsh. You know, not not sure, but something going on in there. We can see some additional channeling down here and over here and in here. Now. <clears throat> Uh, in subsequent years, we've had some work by Marfurk and uh, Gertz 
and Corn and Marford and Randon. And uh, you'll notice that in um, over here in the, the gradient uh, uh, structured tensor based uh, approach that, that uh, we see features as we do over here in the cross correlation approach uh, that we don't really, we see some evidence for it over here, but we don't see this channel as well coming out into this uh, interdistributary bay marsh area. We don't really see this uh, channel coming out here in uh, the eigenstructure, the semblance-based uh, <coughs> approaches, but we do see it in the gradient and the uh, cross-correlation. Uh, some other things to notice are that the gradient looks like, and I haven't really checked into this in detail, but it looks like, you know, we have uh, uh, these discontinuities over here, but instead of a single discontinuity, we have a, a kind of an increase and a decrease and an increase and a decrease, and that might be typical of, you know, uh, something that you'd see if you took the derivative. <clears throat> so, so just, you know, consider that a lot of the things that you see in here, you, you don't see in all of them quite as well. All of them uh, bring out the edges, uh, I, I really do like this cross-correlation view here of Bohorich and Farmer. I can see a lot more here. And think about what you can do if you played around with seismic data sets before. Just think about what you can do by um, changing the, uh, fine-tuning the color bar, using different color bars and, and so on. So a lot of what we see, a lot of what we just saw on those uh, uh, previous uh, slides, it's just related to uh, basic uh, linear regression. And so I'm not going to go over the details here, but I present these slides. You could dwell on them for a minute. Uh, you can think of the what uh, Bohorich and Farmer were doing as you know, calculating the uh, cross-correlation between trace 1 and trace 2, sample by sample. So x could be the amplitudes of trace 1, y the amplitudes of trace 2. And we're assuming a nice uh, linear relationship uh, between the uh, between the amplitudes of one trace. So uh, there are a couple things that we need to figure out in looking at this uh, uh, relationship here. We need to figure figure out what the intercept is A. We need to figure out what B is. And we can see from the data obviously that there there's going to be some error in our estimate of Y and, and in our estimate of Y which is here uh, from the actual value of Y. The actual value of uh, X of course is our uh, 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 independent variable. So, but we're going to have some error, and that's going to be the uh, estimated value of y sub i minus a minus b x sub i. So, or the actual value of y sub i minus the estimated value. And uh, the best fit line is one which is going to minimize this error. So we define the error as q in this case. We let q equal the sum of the squares of the error, and we want to minimize this quantity. So remember that the minimiz minimization approach is just, we'll just take the derivative of this quantity with respect to the uh, intercept and set that equal to zero. And we'll also do the same thing with the slope. We'll set that equal to zero, and we'll minimize the errors. We'll go through the calculations and, and uh, set them equal to zero, and then uh, uh, determine what, this, what the um, intercept is, and in this case we find, and I'll just kind of let you review this, that the uh, intercept is just the average value of the y's in your sample minus the uh, slope times the average value of the x's. And uh, we don't know what the slope is yet, but all we need to do in order to determine the intercept is, well, just calculate the average values of, of x and the average values of y. Um, uh, in your uh, in your sample. Okay, uh, so we go through pretty much the same process for determining the uh, slope, and uh, you know I've just reproduced the uh, the uh, process of taking the derivative here and setting it equal to zero. And you can see that we this, this is a little bit more elaborate approach because when we take the derivative of, of the um, of this quantity with, with respect to the slope, we get a sum of the um, some of the um, uh, x sub i's popping out, so we have to deal with that. 
and um, uh, we have to play some tricks here in order to get it into a certain form. Uh, this form is good enough, either one of these, uh, but what we what one usually does is to uh, add zero to the top and the bottom and in this form, and then reduce it uh, into this form over here, which is basically gives you the um, uh, slope as the ratio of the covariance between x and y and the variance, or between trace 1 and trace 2 and the variance of uh, trace 1 in this case. So the uh, coefficient, uh, just, just to come back to, you know, we'll, we'll draw some uh, interrelationships between these different parameters, but this is another parameter, the coefficient of determination, the correlation of coefficient. We have the slope, we have the inter inter intercept, we also have this uh, correlation of the uh, coefficient of determination and that turns out to be the covariance of uh, of x with y squared over the variance of x times the variance of y and the correlation coefficient is just the square root of that and I think if you if you'll compare this uh, formula to the one that we just showed you'll see some similarities we're, we're basically losing this term in the denominator there and the uh, expression for the slope <coughs> So uh, this is a seismic attribute, the uh, correlation. This is the attribute that Bohorich and uh, Farmer have used to come up with their coherency cube. And uh, you can see that it's a, it's a pretty, pretty simple process we have. Here we could think of uh, comparing the signal to some reference waveform. We might be able to use this in another way. In other words, what we, we know what the characteristic uh, appearance of the reservoir is, uh, and we could we could define that uh, by a certain waveform, and then we could calculate the correlation between the seismic trace and this waveform. So there are lots of different ways that you could use the uh, correlation coefficient. Here I'm just uh, showing you uh, uh, an example, and we've got a, a signal here, and um, there's nothing, you know, this is nothing magical. There's it, there's nothing special about this uh, signal. It's just a, a series of random num numbers that has been low-pass filtered. And uh, so I did, there's really nothing in here that's been specially designed for this illustration here. And the target waveform is uh, comprised of two damped sinusoids with opposite uh, polarity. And so this is just a, a general case, and it illustrates that you'll see considerable correlation uh, <clears throat> in, in the interpretation. It, you know, just, just cross-correlating this uh, uh, waveform uh, sample by sample, you see that we have a high correlation, a relatively high correlation over here. But I think you can also see, just from looking at the variation in the correlation, that it's going to be difficult to interpret. Um, so here's another value at this particular point. You can see where the this uh, waveform that we've chosen here, which you know could be just the wavelet, uh, but uh, from a thin bed, as we have a high amplitude here, a much lower amplitude here, and then another higher amplitude here. That we see some correlation, but you can see that the we've got a little step here in this response in the signal that we don't see in the wavelet. Uh, correlation is not quite as good as it is up here. So um, <clears throat> this is just an example of you know calculating the uh, cross correlation between the uh, signal and the wavelet, and you can see that it's not going to be all that easy to uh, to interpret. And what you might want to do is to refine your analysis into a zone of interest, so that you are you know you, you don't you don't get overwhelmed by correlation coefficients from everywhere, but you know that you're your zone of interest is, is right here between these two times, so you might concentrate on looking at the cross-correlation of your reference uh, 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 response, uh, reservoir response, to the signal just over this limited uh, time range. Let's, let's say this is your reservoir interval. You've got wells that have penetrated there. You've got synthetics that, uh, that verify that this is the uh, reservoir interval, and you're just Kind of following your interpretation along and, and looking at the uh, comparison of values from the waveform, the reference uh, uh, reservoir response to the uh, to the seismic uh, seismic signal, and uh, we see these correlations over here. So, 
And, you know, come back to this um, idea of Bohorich and, and Farmer, where here we see some discontinuity and it gets given a high value. Over here we see some similarity. So what you do with the numbers uh, depends on, you know, what you're looking for and how you want to use it. Um, so here are some, you know, just some general footnotes and some things to think about. Uh, this is the uh, correlation coefficient. Remember that it's just the square root of the coefficient of determination. And it has this form over here. We already pointed out that it's very much like the slope. We have this additional term in the denominator that we didn't have in the, uh, in the equation for the slope. We'll talk about that later. Uh, so what I want you to do is to think about the autocorrelation first, and then we'll talk a little bit more about the cross-correlation, but think about the autocorrelation. What it does is it compares a function with itself, a different lags tau, and the autocorrelation can be represented in continuous form uh, by this a of tau is equal to, and we're integrating here from minus infinity to infinity, of the function with itself uh, delayed in the, or lagged in the positive and the negative directions. You'll see that this function has to be symmetrical, and here it is in its discrete form. Uh, and this is just the uh, lag or the delay. And the, uh, we're, comparing, we're comparing the, the, waveform, the uh, trace with itself, the function with itself, but with itself shifted by a certain uh, time tau to get a particular output at that lag time. So what I'd like you, you to do, you know, just think about for the next time is consider how these two expressions might be equivalent. And that's what I'm talking about here is how could the correlation coefficient and the autocorrelation be equivalent or the cross-correlation. We haven't talked about the cross-correlation yet, but that's really the question I'm asking is uh, how could the cross-correlation you know, at a certain lag be equivalent to, to this. And, and what would happen if the, well, let's just say if I calculated the correlation coefficient of f with its lagged image, think about how these two expressions would be similar. That's, that's the better question to ask. And also consider what would happen if the signal has zero mean. Think about your seismic data. Think about what it does. It just kind of goes back and forth, doesn't it? It goes from positive amplitudes to negative amplitudes to positive amplitudes. And, and so over short time windows, it's on average, the amplitude is about zero. Well, uh, that, that's enough for, uh, for one day. And uh, thanks for, for uh, uh, joining me. And uh, we'll see you next time.